Hi, you guys. It's me, Miss Fry. All right, chapter 48. I'm going to read a little bit longer today, okay, because I won't post tomorrow. Um, we ate dinner and we opened presents. That's when I got the surprise. That's where we left off yesterday. Chapter 48. Susan gave me a book and a sweater she'd knit herself. She gave Jamie a sweater and a new toy airplane. I gave everyone, even Lord Thornton and Ruth, but not Ruth's parents, as I hadn't expected them, hand-knitted hats. I started to feel a sort of energy coming from Lord and Lady Thornton. It made me nervous. It was a bit like the energy Ma'am gave off before she started walloping people. Friendlier, but still like that. I shifted closer to Susan, who looked as puzzled as I did, when Lord Thornton set a wrapped box onto my lap. Wait, he said as I picked it up. I want to read something first. He drew an envelope out of his waistcoat pocket and took from the envelope a letter. It was worn and creased as though it had been folded and unfolded over and over again. Hmm. Lord Thornton cleared his throat. Then he paused and read, Swallow, paused, swallowed and cleared his throat again. When he first spoke, his voice trembled. Dear Lord Thornton, he read. I should have written, written earlier, I know, but it's been a bit, well, I won't make excuses. I should have written earlier. I'm sorry. Your son, Jonathan, John, as I like to call him, was a close friend of mine. He was a good pilot and a brave man. I'm sure you've heard the story of our last little adventure, but I thought I'd tell you how it looked from my side. Being a pilot gets pretty hard after a while going up night after night, and always some planes not making it back. You start to think you're next every night, and that wears at you. It starts to eat away at your insides. It's not fear, exactly. It's more like you can't bear the waiting. Anyhow, one night Johnny came to find me pretty late. We were both off that night, and we should have been sleeping, but sometimes you can't sleep no matter how tired you are. Johnny said, was I ready for an adventure? And I said, sure. He'd borrowed a couple of motorbikes. He said he wanted to keep a promise he'd made, and he thought he'd better do it while he had the chance. So we set off through the night, pitch dark, colder than it should have been. Anyway, in a couple of hours, we pulled up near this cottage on a big estate. <coughs> estate. I didn't realize at first that the estate was your home. John didn't talk about stuff like that. He snuck around back and threw pebbles at one of the windows. Next thing I know, out come these schoolgirls rubbing sleep from their eyes. John's sister looked like him, of course. Then there were two dark-haired girls who might have been sisters, one younger, one older. We all piled onto the bikes and went along to the back of the big house where the stables were. John asked, did I ride? I said, never in my life, mate. I grew up in Liverpool City, not many horses there. So he told me to follow along on the bike, but keep quiet. He didn't want to wake the old groom. The girls came out with some horses and John gone got out, out one, and next thing he was tossing the smaller hair girl into the saddle of the biggest horse. Her eyes shone. I wouldn't have wanted to sit on that thing. It looked snorty and fierce to me. But this kid was so excited. I knew this was the promise John had made. <clears throat> they went off down the fields, me following. Then something startled the big horse, and away it ran, fast and furious, like it had been shot out of a cannon. The little girl bounced around for a moment. Honest, I thought she was going to be hurt. And next thing, she's up in her stirrups like a jockey running in the Grand National. She's flying across the fields with the others, chasing but not catching her, and me following, thinking an ambulance was going to be required. Eventually, the horse quit running. The girl on his back looked over her shoulder. Her hair had all come loose around her head, and her cheeks were bright pink, and she was laughing. She wasn't afraid, not one tiny bit. She said, that was wonderful, Jonathan. Oh, thank you. We had to hurry to get back in time. We left the girls with the horses and whatever explanations they'd have to make. I assumed the girl on John's horse was another of the local gentry, but when we got back to the airfield, John said no. He claimed she was from the east end of London, the bad part, evacuated at the start of the war. He said when she first came, she hadn't been able to walk. He said, did you see her face? Did you see how brave she was? I said, I saw. Later that day, he said, that's what we're fighting for, that kind of courage. We can't get beat, not when we're fighting for the spirit of England. 
I knew what he meant. It made a fellow feel better, somehow, to know that there were still green fields and both children laughing in them, even in the middle of this war. John said he was going to name his plane Invincible Ada. He was going to have that painted on her tail. He never got the chance, but he would have done it, and I wanted you to know. And if you could tell the girl named Ada about it, I think John would have wanted her to know too. Lord Thornton folded the letter, replaced it in its envelope, and returned the envelope to his waistcoat pocket. He nodded at me. Open your gift, my dear. Inside the box was a leather halter, cleaned and oiled soft and supple. The brass nameplate on the cheek piece read, Oban. It was Oban's halter. I said, I don't understand. Lady Thornton looked Lady Thornton looked fierce, almost angry. She said, we're giving him to you. We're giving you the horse. Uh oh. <laughs> I said, you can't do that. He's Jonathan's. I don't think I really understood death until that moment. I mean, I knew what dead meant. I knew that Jonathan, like my father and mother, like Stephen White's family, like Becky, like every other dead person ever, was not coming back. But I didn't get it until then. If that's hard to understand, well, so are a lot of things. No one said anything. Everyone in the room looked at me. I lifted the halter, rubbed the nameplate, remembered that beautiful, beautiful summer dawn. I said, I love him very much. Lord Thornton said, good, that's all we ask. I said, do you mean it? Is he really mine? Of course we mean it, Lord Thornton said. I can do anything I want with him? Yes, Lady Thornton said a touch sardonically. I see where you're going with this. Oban is yours. You can let anyone ride him that you want. Thank you, I said. I got up, uh-oh. I got up and pushed the halter into Ruth's hands. I said, if he's mine, then I'm giving him to Ruth. He's her horse now. Wow. When I first read this, I was like, what? <laughs> wow. Okay. Oh, Lady Thornton. Okay, chapter 49. Ruth stared at me. She said, I'm Jewish. I don't get Christmas presents. It's not a Christmas present, I said. It's a friendship present. It's, it's a sister present. You heard what Jonathan Spread wrote. He thought we were sisters. I have butter. I don't need Oban. You do. I'm leaving next week, Ruth said. She clutched the halter. I can't take a horse. You'll come home sometimes, I said. I'll take care of him for you until you do. Ruth bent over the halter. Her shoulders shook. Her mother put her arm around her and said something softly in German. Ruth answered in German without raising her head. For heaven's sakes, Lady Thornton said, annoyed. Yes, said Susan, I'd say so. <laughs> I could tell Lady Thornton didn't like what I'd done but she couldn't undo it. I couldn't tell what Lord Thornton thought, but I didn't care. Maggie was grinning, Jamie was too. Susan said, come help me make tea, Ada, and led the way into the kitchen. Are you angry? I asked her once it was just us two. Of course not, she said. Why should I be? Only Oban's a far fancier horse than Butter. Even I know that. Ruth's a fancier rider than me. Plus, I love Butter. Plus, why would I ever need uh, more than one horse? Susan laughed. You'd be surprised, she said, how much some people think they need. I shrugged. There's a war on. Yes, she said, and you're winning it. Only fair warning, I don't think Lady Thornton's going to be happy about all this once she's had time to think. Susan was right. All Christmas evening, I could feel Lady Thornton's anger building. I could see it coming like a storm across the sea from up on my lookout hill. She was angry that I'd given Oban away and to a Jew Jewish German. She was angry that Jonathan had come to see me and Maggie instead of her. She was very, very angry that we hadn't given her the chance to see him one last time. She was also angry that Jonathan wanted to name his airplane after me. She didn't say so but I knew. I can kind of understand all that from Lady Thornton's point of view. Can't you? A little bit? As a mother, I can totally get that. It would be hard for me in the beginning if I knew my son had done something like that, I think. 
I think I hope I would understand it and really be think it was cool later, but I can, I can kind of relate to that a little bit. You, sh you should have told me, Lady Thornton said to Maggie the next morning. It was Boxing Day, the anniversary of the paper chase. I remember Jonathan stopping a bomb when I fell off at the ditch. Remembered him saying, I'm trying to act like a gentleman. I remembered his smile and felt his loss all over again. If it was this bad for me, it had to be so much worse for the Thorntons. I think what I mean when I say I could understand this from Lady Thornton is if I had been through everything that Lady Thornton had gone through. Right? I mean, Ada's right. This must be horrible for them, you know? I mean, we know it's horrible for them. It's horrible. Loss is horrible. So I can, um, I can certainly relate. Well, obviously, I can't relate because nothing like that ha happened to me. But um, anyway, I digress. I promised Jonathan I wouldn't tell, Maggie said. You should have told me before you promised. You shouldn't have promised. You should have told me first thing. I couldn't, said Maggie. She ran back upstairs, choking on half-suppressed tears. Lady Thornton turned to me. You should have, too. Y you should have, too. I should have ratted Maggie out or broken my promise to Jonathan. Which? I'm glad I didn't, I said. I knew I shouldn't be rude. I should be grateful. But the nastier Lady Thornton acted, the less gratitude I felt. Ruth and Lord Thornton took Ruth's parents to the stables to meet Oban. The Schmitz were so knowledgeable about horses that Lord Thornton arranged we should all go riding that afternoon. Me, Maggie, Ruth, Lord Thornton, and Ruth's parents. You too, he said to Lady Thornton. I think not, she sniffed. It would be good for us, Lord Thornton said. No, she said. The rest of us went anyhow. We galloped and jumped things and for two hours felt happy. Oban went beautifully. Ruth couldn't quit smiling. Afterward, her mother petted me and made a fuss. I didn't know what she said, but I rather liked it. Ruth was sleeping in Maggie's bed while her parents slept in her room, and Maggie was sharing my bed with me. After our ride together, I couldn't sleep. I kept talking about Butter and Oban and how we'd saved him from colic and about our ride that day. Ada, my Maggie said, be quiet. It's like having sisters, I said. I never had family except Jamie. You had your mother, Ruth said. I didn't, I said. Someday I'll tell you. Ruth extended her hand across the space between the beds. We'd taken the blackout down and I could see dimly in the shadowed light. I held my hand out to Ruth. Maggie too, Ruth said. Maggie sat up on her elbow so that her hand would reach ours. All three together, Ruth said. Sisters. Say it in German, I said. Schwestern, Ruth said. Schwestern, Maggie giggled. That's hilarious. <laughs> Schwestern. Ruth repeated firmly, you two are my Schwestern now, so I will tell you a secret. I'm not going to Oxford. I dropped your hand and sat up in bed. You said you passed your exams. I did, Ruth said. I learned all the maths. I'm ready, but Lord Thornton said that if I wanted to, I could work where he and my father are working instead. I will go to Oxford after the war. Real war work, Maggie said. Ruth laughed. Yes, very real. I need to tell you about that. Where, I asked, what are you doing? I can't tell, Ruth said, but I will write to you and you will both write to me. And Maggie, you need to exercise my horse for me whenever you are home from school. You're starting to outgrow your pony. You'll come home when you can, I said. Ruth lay back on her bed. I could hear her smiling. She said, your government has decided we aren't spies. My family will live together and my father and I will work together. And yes, I will come home when I can. The next morning, Lady Thornton started in on Maggie first thing. Susan, Ruth, and I escaped to the kitchen to make breakfast. Lady Thornton came to the table in a cloud of fury, stiff and upright. Maggie sank into the chair beside her, her eyes red and swollen from crying. Suddenly, I blew up a cloud of fury of my own. None of this was Maggie's fault or mine. I don't see why you're being so horrible, I said to Lady Thornton. You've known about that letter for weeks. She had. Lord Thornton had sent her a copy. He'd said so. Hearing it read aloud again was difficult, Lady Thornton said. And when I think how my own daughter acted deceitfully, you didn't have to read it out again, I said. You could have kept it secret or handed it to us to read. 
she sniffed. Well, that was Lord Thornton's choice. I gathered myself up taller. Then be angry with him, I said, looking Lady Thornton in the eye. Not Maggie. You're making her miserable about something she can't ever fix. It isn't fair. Bright spots of color appeared on Lady Thornton's cheeks. I hardly think, she said, that I deserve to be reprimanded by someone like you. Oh, Susan said. I held Lady Thornton's gaze even though my heart was hammering. You don't deserve a daughter like Maggie, I said. You are a terrible mother. Everyone in earshot froze. Lady Thornton went white. Then Ruth said, into the cold, dead silence, Ada, apologize this instant. You know that isn't true. I glared at Ruth. She glared back. She's not doing anything right, I said. Maggie needs her, and she keeps being angry. She's angry at Jonathan's dad, and Maggie can't fix it, and it's not Maggie's fault, Ruth said. She's doing the best she can. How would you know? I felt frustration building up inside me like a rising wave. She's horrid to you. She's horrid to everyone. Ada, Susan said. All the mothers are horrible. <laughs> oh, man. She's, she's, she's in a fury, isn't she? She keeps saying stuff that I know she doesn't mean. I got up from the table and ran up the stairs to my room. A few minutes later, someone knocked on my door. I didn't answer. Ada, it wasn't Susan or Maggie. It was Ruth. She came in and sat on the foot of the bed. I'd wrapped myself in my coverlet so that only my eyes showed. I wasn't crying. Susan said, Susan said Christmas time is hard for you, Ruth said. I did all right this year, I said. The whole season is hard, Ruth repeated. So? So maybe you can see not everything is Lady Thornton's fault. I don't know why you're on her side, I said. She's never liked you. Ruth sighed. I'm not on anyone's side. It was awful what you said. That she didn't deserve to have Maggie when Maggie's all she has left? She shouldn't be so mean to Maggie. She should listen to Maggie. She should love Maggie, even if Maggie isn't perfect. She does, Ruth said. Lady Thornton isn't perfect either. She does love Maggie. Well, how would you know? I knew I sounded rude. I didn't care. Ruth grabbed the edge of my blanket and tucked it over her feet. Our bedrooms were always cold in winter. My mother is a genius, she said. That's what my father says. That we're smart, him and me, but that she's smarter than both of us. Only her parents never allowed her to go to university because she was a girl. So she never got to do anything with all her brains, and sometimes it frustrates her, and she gets angry, but it doesn't have anything to do with us. So, Ruth's mother was kind. She kissed me and patted me. She was nothing like Lady Thornton. My mother got us to Germany. Got us, excuse me, got us out of Germany, Ruth continued. She persisted. She kept trying and trying until she found somewhere that would take us. She wasn't afraid to leave our home behind. She was sorry she couldn't convince the rest of our family to leave, but she was brave and strong for my father and me. My mother was a monster, I said. I can't remember one good thing about her. So your mother was a monster. It doesn't mean mine is. It doesn't mean Lady Thornton is. Ruth pro prodded me with her foot. People are complicated. You yourself are not the easiest person to love, <laughs> but you are still my sister. I glared at her. You aren't the easiest person to love either, I said. I'm sure I'm not, Ruth said, and yet you love me. I am your sister, too. When my mother is difficult, Ruth continued, and she is difficult quite often, I think about the look on her face when our boat landed in England, how grateful she was not just that she was out of Germany, but that she'd gotten me out of Germany, that I was safe. Ruth looked at me. Lady Thornton is trying to keep Maggie safe. She's doing it wrong, I said. <laughs> Maybe, Ruth said. Maybe. That doesn't mean she isn't trying to do right. I blew out my breath. So, Ruth said, so you need to apologize. I didn't want to. I dreaded what might happen. But after Ruth left, Maggie came in. You shouldn't have said that, she said. I was trying to stick up for you, I said. I know, she said. You still shouldn't have said it. 
Ruth and I are going to the stables with our fathers and Frau Schmidt. My mother's staying here. All right. I understood what she was telling me. My stomach hurt. My hands felt damp. I sat in my freezing bedroom and reminded myself to breathe. After a long time, I unwrapped myself from the coverlet. I walked carefully down the stairs. Lady Thornton and Susan were sitting by the fire in the big room, drinking tea. I didn't see Jamie. I, I didn't know what I was supposed to say. I walked toward them. My knees shook. Lady Thornton and Susan looked up. They waited. I'm sorry I said you were a bad mother, I said. Lady Thornton nodded. Thank you. She took another sip of tea. I waited for what happened next. Have some breakfast, Ada, Susan said. You haven't eaten. There's oatmeal on the back of the stove. I, I can eat breakfast? My voice came out small and frightened. Lady Thornton frowned. We are not in the habit of starving children who misbehave. I've accepted your apology. Go eat. I walked toward the kitchen in a sort of daze. Was that really the end of it? Mam used to put me in the cabinet. I swallowed hard. I couldn't eat any oatmeal, but I had a cup of tea. Later in the day, when I'd had a chance to calm down a bit, Lady Thornton sat beside me on the sofa. What was the worst thing about your life? Lady Thornton asked, before you came here. I thought for a while. Coals fell in the grate. My mother could have fixed my foot, I said at last. She chose not to, and then she blamed me for it. Another silence stretched out long and thin. That's why you're so angry, Lady Thornton said. You think I'm blaming, blaming Maggie for things to do with Jonathan. I'm not. I blame myself. Poor mother. Last chapter I'll read. Chapter 51. In a room that night, I still felt fragile. I thought something worse would happen. Oh, oh sorry. I'm not paying attention to how I'm reading. Um, I'm going to start again. In a room that night, I still felt fragile. I thought something worse would happen, I said to Maggie. I was still willing to defend you, though. I was trying to help. I know, Maggie said. St. Ada slain the dragon. Why do you think my mother was so horrible? Across the room, Ruth made noise between her teeth. Why is Hitler horrible? She asked. No one knows. Some people are horrible. You were unlucky with your first mother. You were lucky with your second. Susan's not my mother, I said. Ruth shrugged. You can say that if you want to. <laughs> Ruth and her parents and Lord Thornton left. The rest of us walked them to the train station. The government had finally completely forbidden any private use of gasoline. Lady Thornton's car was up on blocks in the corner of the stable yard. Ruth hugged me goodbye. Don't look so tragic, she said. I'll write to you. You'll write back. Her mailing address was an office in London. It wasn't where she was really going to be. They'll forward your letters to me, Ruth said. Don't be sad. I'm not gone forever. Stephen White seemed to be gone forever. After he left, I'd never heard from him. Not once. Ruth gave me another hug. My little Schwester, she said. She kissed Jamie, little Bruder, she said. Bruder, brother, Bruder. Bro I think it's Bruder. I'll look it up. I forgot I needed to do that before I started. Sorry about that. Take care of that pig for me. Maggie and I rode across snow-covered fields in bitter wind. I was riding Oban for Ruth, for Jonathan. Oban tossed his head, wanting to gallop, but I couldn't let him on the icy, uncertain ground. You'll have to trot for hours to work him down, Maggie said. Her pony ivy puffed white clouds of breath, struggling to keep up. We rode along the field where the grouse exploded. I would never see that field without remembering Jonathan. Invincible Ada, Maggie said, so I knew she was thinking of him too. That wasn't really about me, I said. Jonathan wanted something to fight for. He, he was seeing what he wanted me to be. When the time came for Maggie to go back to school, she put up a battle that if it had been against Hitler, might have won us the war. Unfortunately, it was against Lady Thornton. <laughs> Maggie railed and shouted and wept. Lady Thornton never flinched. Finally, Maggie stood up at the dinner table. If you make me go back, she said low and hard, I will never forgive you. I will hate you for as long as I live. Quark. That was worse than calling her a terrible mother. 
I wondered what Ruth would say. Lady Thornton picked up a fork full of food, chewed it slowly and swallowed before she replied. To ensure your safety and happiness, she said, that's a chance I'm willing to take. I will not apologize, Maggie said at night in our bedroom. I am not sorry. Okay. I think in two weeks we'll finish. That's a lot. Woo! Wow. That's a lot. Okay. Um, okay, you guys. Miss you. I will talk to you, not tomorrow, because it's Thursday, but we'll see you on Friday. Okay? Can't wait. Bye.